You know, as long as I can remember, I have been in church all of my life, basically. And uh, I don't say that as a complaint. I'm thankful that I have been raised in church. And typically in church on Wednesday evenings, we used to refer to that as prayer meeting night. It was a time when the people of God came together in the church and we would take time to share requests for prayer, share testimonies of what the Lord had been doing in our lives. And then we would take some time to pray for one another as part of our praise and worship time together. Now, on Wednesday evenings at the Crossway Church, we typically do a Bible study. Uh, we do an expositional study of a book in the Bible. We go chapter by chapter, verse by verse, uh, to draw out of the Scripture what the Bible says, and then we make the application so that we can have our walk with the Lord Jesus Christ enhanced and more productive. Sometimes we take a topic and we look uh, for several Wednesday nights at a certain topic. But uh, since last year, we have been dedicating the first Wednesday night of our midweek services on Wednesdays, uh, the first Wednesday of each month, for the subject of prayer. Uh, we come together and we take some time to share some requests for prayer. We may share a testimony or two from different ones who want to share what the Lord is doing in their life. And then we just take time to pray. And uh, that's a very, very important exercise. You know, Jesus said in Luke's Gospel, the 18th chapter, that men should always pray and not to lose heart. And uh, so prayer is something that should be natural for a believer. Now, sometimes when we come together for prayer, we give consideration to the Bible, and sometimes we we learn new concepts or new insights are gained from the scriptures on the subject of prayer. Most of the time, it's just having our pure hearts stirred up by way of remembrance about prayer, the need to pray, how to pray, what to pray for. And I know that all of us have needs. We have personal needs. We have needs in our families. Uh, we have needs for our church and our church family. Uh, we pray for the ministries of our church. Then we pray for the community and the county and the state and certainly the nation. You know, there are a lot of people that are in the world who have no physical individual, no family member, no friend that ever calls their name in prayer. And I think that is a sad, sad commentary on life for some individuals. So we just attempt to pray in a general way as well as in a specific way. Now, I want to speak to you on the subject of prayer for this evening, and I want to speak to you about focused prayer, something that's important for you and for me to understand as to how we are to pray. And I trust that this will be uh, an encouragement to you. It'll probably be just a, a reminder to you. Some of these things you probably already know. Uh, perhaps it'll be a new insight for you and it'll encourage you and motivate you to pray. But the important thing is that uh, we not just simply hear another Bible study, but we do something with it that we pray. Now, I want to read two verses of Scripture that are very familiar to you uh, from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. Jesus is speaking here and he says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. And I pray the Lord will bless uh, the reading of his word to our hearts together. You know, as long as I can remember, since being called to preach the gospel, it's always been something of a of a satisfying thing to me to know that, you know, God had one son that he sent from heaven to the earth, and that son not only was our Savior, and uh, he was so many things to so many different people, but principally he was a preacher. You ever thought about that? Jesus was a preacher. Now, his message 
uh, mirrored the message that John the Baptist preached when he said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. But there were so many other things that Jesus preached and taught on. And the Bible says in Mark's gospel that the common people heard him gladly. And uh, the adverb gladly means with pleasure. Uh, we know one of the reasons why the people heard him gladly is because according to Mark's gospel chapter 1, Jesus spoke like no other earthly man could speak. He, had sp he spoke as one who had great authority. I think about it sometimes. The Bible says in Luke's gospel that Jesus entered the synagogue on the Sabbath as was his custom. That meant that every Saturday, every Sabbath Sunday, or every Sabbath, which was Saturday for Jesus, uh, he always went to the synagogue. And one of the things that they did in the synagogue in conjunction with their prayer and their praise is that they heard a teaching from the scriptures. I've often thought about Jesus as being the Son of God, the Word of God, according to John chapter 1, sitting and listening to someone speak about and speak from the Word of God. I suppose there were times when Jesus might have thought to himself, that's not really what was intended, or I wish that you had brought this out. But we never have record of Jesus doing anything like that. But uh, Jesus was indeed a preacher. Now, the longest sermon that we have that Jesus preached has been characterized as the Sermon on the Mount. It uh, comprises the 5th through 7th chapters of the book of Matthew. Now, Luke in chapter 6 and verses 20 down through verse 49 gives us a summation of the sermon that Jesus preached. But uh, it was a topical sermon. It was a sermon that Jesus preached very on, early on in his earthly ministry, and it dealt with the various matters that were important to understand if you were going to be a devoted disciple or follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, twice in this sermon, I'm looking particularly at uh, the Sermon on the Mount as recorded in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus has something important to say about the subject of prayer. Uh, in Chapter 6, verses 5 through 13, Jesus speaks on the subject of prayer. And then, of course, in these two verses that uh, we have read together, and in this context, Jesus is speaking on the subject of prayer. Now, the prayer life of Jesus is an extremely interesting and rewarding study for any child of God from the Holy Scriptures. It always uh, makes me understand the importance and the seriousness of prayer that if Jesus, the Son of God, the Word of God, who had all authority and power, needed to pray, well, how much more should we also pray? You find Jesus uh, speaking about the importance of prayer from time to time, and you also find Jesus praying. Sometimes he rises up early in the morning, long before light, to get alone with the Father, to pray about the day that he's going to encounter. Uh, we find Jesus praying in the wilderness alone. We find him praying up on a mountaintop with his inner circle of disciples. He prays in the garden. He prays in the, uh, on the cross. Jesus knew the importance of prayer, and he prayed. Now, if Jesus knew the importance of prayer and he prayed, what does that say to us? Doesn't it also remind us about the importance of prayer and the need to pray in our own lives? Now, I think all of us who are Christians would say, yeah, we know we need to pray. In fact, Jesus said in Luke's Gospel, the 18th chapter, in the first verse, that men ought to pray always and not lose heart. Uh, Paul says in the book of 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5, that we're to pray without ceasing. So we know that prayer is as common to the believer and necessary as water is necessary for a fish to swim in. But so many times we fail in this endeavor. We don't pray like we should. Uh, sometimes we take sort of a fatalistic view of life. You know, uh, We say, well, you know, God's going to do what God wants to do, and 
my praying about it's not going to make any difference. And that's not the attitude that we're to have in prayer. Uh, sometimes, because we're so busy with our lives these days, we don't really take time to pray. And if there's a need or a crisis that occurs, uh, rather than taking time to pray about it before we start addressing it, what we have a tendency to do is just uh, sort of typically rush into it. You know, we want to we want to fix it. We want to do something about it. And sometimes when we think about prayer, uh, we are discouraged to pray. And sometimes it's because we've gone a long period of time, perhaps without praying as we know we should. And uh, perhaps we have committed some sin or some trespass in our lives. And we think to ourselves, well, you know, I'm really not in a spiritual condition to pray. Uh, I don't know that the Lord would really hear me when I pray, and I really need to pray up and get close to God in order to pray about this particular matter that I'm confronted with. You know, all of those are common excuses not to pray. And where do you think those excuses come from? Do you think they come to us from the Lord? Or do you think they come to us from Satan? You know, the last thing in the world Satan wants any of us ever to do is to pray. But I want to encourage you to pray. And from these uh, two verses of Scripture, I want to, particularly in verse 7, I want to just share something with you that I hope will be an encouragement to you to pray and motivate you to pray. And that's the way we pray. Uh, Jesus says, first of all, ask and you will receive. Now, this is a verb, ask, that speaks to us about the importance of coming humbly before the Lord. And the reason I say that is because this particular verb uh, deals with one who is inferior, asking of someone who is superior. Uh, we come humbly before the Lord because there's a deficiency in our lives. Uh, and we know that the Lord is the all-sufficient one. We come and we ask because there is a need in our life. And we know that Jesus is able to supply all of our need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And so this particular verb speaks to us about how we come to God in prayer. We're to come humbly. Now, this uh, smacks against the whole idea of pride. In uh, the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, and verse 16, the writer to the Hebrews says that we're to come boldly to the throne of God's grace. Now, the word boldly does not mean arrogantly. It means confidently. So when we come to the throne of grace for prayer, we're coming to the great King of kings, the Lord of lords, the God of all, the creator of the universe, who is able to meet every single need that we possibly could have. Listen, you don't have a need that God is unable to meet. You don't have a question that God is not able to answer. You don't have a problem that's so naughty that God cannot give you some help with it and give you some encouragement with it. So Jesus says, first of all, ask and it shall be given to you. So whatever it is that you have need of, just come to God and simply ask him, but ask him in a humble fashion. Then we're told that we are to seek and with the promise, we shall find. Now, it's interesting that all of these verbs are action verbs. In fact, they're present imperative action verbs in the Greek language, which means that it's something that we are to do, and it's something that we are to do on a consistent basis. And all of them have a promise. So if you ask, you're going to receive. And if you seek, you're going to find. Now, we're talking here about the subject of prayer. And so when we look at this verb seek, 
we're thinking about asking earnestly. We are to pray earnestly. And by that, I mean that we are to pray zealously, with energy. It, it means that we're not to pray in a shallow, nonchalant, casual manner where we're just repeating oftentimes learned phrases. We're to be diligent when we pray. Remember, James says the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man or woman avails much. And the words effective, fervent from Ma uh, James chapter 5 or 16 is one Greek word. And uh, from that one Greek word, we have those two words translated effective, fervent, but uh, effective, fervent, but from those two words, words, we get the one English word, energy, with energy. He says, seek and you shall find. Let me ask you something. Have you ever got ready to go to a meeting or to go to work or go to church? And uh, you're going out the door and you get ready to lock the door. And all of a sudden, it, 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 it's apparent to you that you don't have your keys in your pocket. So what do you think? What do you do? Well, you go back in and you begin to look for your keys. And you probably will mutter something like, where in the world did I leave my keys? Well, you'll look on the counter where you typically might keep them. Uh, you will sometimes look in a drawer where you may put your valuables at night before you go to bed. Uh, if you're a woman, you'll look in the pocketbook that you carried the day before. Uh, you may look in the jacket pocket or pants pocket from the pants that you wore the day before. Uh, you might even move the cushions in the chair where you were sitting the night before, thinking that perhaps uh, the keys fell out of your pocket and got down in the seat some way. Well, you see, that's what Jesus is saying. When he says seek, he's talking about earnestly seeking with energy. You've all heard the expression, I know, you have to put legs on your prayers. And uh, this is one of those illustrations for that. I mean, there's some, sometimes we have to kind of examine our priorities when we're praying and move some things around when we're praying as we're seeking for the Lord and the Lord is begin, beginning to speak to us about uh, some need. In uh, Luke's Gospel, the 15th chapter, Jesus tells the great parable about the prodigal son who found himself and came back to the father. But prior to the prodigal son parable, Jesus tells two other parables. He tells the parable about the lost sheep. Then he tells the parable about the lost coin. Now, what those two parables have in common is this, something that was in the possession of the person was lost. And once it was lost, they earnestly began to seek it. Uh, the shepherd leaves the 99 sheep and he goes and he looks desperately for the one that is lost. He goes to the ravines, he goes to the high places, he goes out to the still waters. Uh, he's looking desperately for that sheep. The woman who loses the coin, well, the Bible says, that she lights a lamp and she sweeps her house, which means that she's moving furniture around and she's looking behind things and uh, putting the light in different places. She's looking, she's earnestly looking. And this is what Jesus is teaching us. Ask humbly and it will be given to you. Seek earnestly and you will find. Then he says, knock and it shall be opened unto you. Now, this speaks about us praying, not only with the aspect of humility and earnestness, but also with persistence. He's saying, ask persistently. To ask and to keep on asking. In other words, what Jesus is teaching us here is that prayer is not an exercise where it's one and done. You just do it one time, and then you don't, you don't worry about doing it anymore. Uh, you need to pray until you have some response from God. And in this case, he says, knock and it shall be opened to you. 
you have to think about uh, the Apostle Peter in Acts chapter 12, where he's been locked up by Herod, and the anticipation of Herod is he's going to execute Peter after Easter. And uh, a prayer meeting was called in the home of John Mark's mother, and uh, believers had gathered together in her house, and they were praying earnestly. They were knocking and seeking earnestly for the Lord to miraculously intervene and deliver Peter from the clutches of Herod. And you know what happened? Peter was delivered. And Peter went to the home of John Mark's mother, and he began to knock on the door of the outer gate. And he knocked, and he knocked, and he knocked, until finally someone came to the door and realized it was Peter and let him in. Now, the lesson is obvious. If Peter had just knocked once or twice and said, well, I know they're there, but they're not going to come, then and left, he never would have gotten in, and they would not have known that their prayer had been answered. Then I think about uh, the prophet Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 18. You remember when he's praying for rain? Do you remember how many times he prayed? He prayed seven times. And the sixth time that he prayed, uh, his servant came back and reported that he had seen a cloud about the size of a man's hand. And Elijah told uh, his servant, you go tell Ahab to prepare for an abundance of rain. Rain was something that they desperately needed in that day. There'd been a severe drought, and uh, people were dying. Livestock was dying. People were starving to death, and they needed that rain. Well, suppose Elijah had prayed once. Suppose it was one and done. Suppose he'd prayed twice, three times. He prayed until he got a breakthrough in the clouds. God responded. You probably heard uh, the phrase, dead as a doornail. You know where that comes from? Long before there were doorbells, people would nail a big iron uh, ring on their door. And the iron ring would rest on the head of a nail that they nailed in the door as well. And when someone came to the door, they would, uh, they would tap the door. And uh, they would tap that ring on that nail, and uh, that would indicate to the person on the inside that someone's at the door, they need to go to the door. But sometimes a person would come to that door, and they would take that ring, and just rather than tap it, they would slam it down just slam it down repeatedly, and it would encourage the person that was in to have a little more enthusiasm about getting up and going to the door. And the reason for it is they thought that there was going to be the death of the nail. So you have that phrase that developed out of that, dead as a doornail. Listen, we're to pray, and we're to pray consistently. We're to pray persistently. We're to pray with humility. We're to pray earnestly. And each of these verbs have a, they all are present imperative Greek in the Greek language, in verb, the present imperative verb tense, which means that we're to keep doing this. We're to just, we're not to do this once or twice, but we're to keep on as we pray. This is how we pray. And uh, when I say that, you know, you're rapping on the door uh, with uh, a lot of volume, I'm not insinuating that you have to be very loud in your prayer. You know, all of us perhaps at some point in time have heard people or we know people that every time they pray, they pray with tremendous volume. Now, it's okay to pray that way if you feel personally uh, needing to pray that way. But what the important point is that you pray and that you pray with humility and that you pray with earnestness and that you pray with persistence. Now, when you pray, you have to be praying uh, with faith. This is what James teaches us in James chapter 1, <clears throat> excuse me, verses 6 through 8. He says, uh, you have not because you ask not. And if you ask, you've got to believe. For if you don't have faith to believe, that you're like the, the wind or the wave tossed to and fro. We need to have a sense of faith. 
that when you pray, you're not praying to some invisible, non-existent force. You're praying to your Heavenly Father, who knows what you need before you ask Him, but still, He wants you to ask Him. Now, there's another very important component about prayer, and that is that you have to pray in the will of God. I think that uh, it's important to understand and remember the context in which Jesus is making this declaration to us with this pattern and this promise concerning prayer. He's talking about principles that are to be very real in the life of uh, anyone who follows after the Lord. And he's talking about a righteous life. He's talking about one who has a relationship with God the Father. So you can't just take these verses out of their context and say, well, they're going to apply to me if you're not following the Lord, if you're not living for the Lord. Now, it doesn't mean you have to be perfect, but it does mean that you have to be in a pursuing, developing relationship with the Lord. Remember, the psalmist said in Psalm 16, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. That word regard means to practice, willfully, habitually, something that we know is in conflict with what the Father would have for us to do. And so it's important for us to be in the right spiritual frame of mind in relationship with the Lord when we pray. We have to pray in faith, and we also have to pray for God's will. The only thing that lies outside prayer as an answer is anything that lies outside the will of God. Now, don't be discouraged about that. In the uh, book of 1 John chapter 5, uh, verses 14 and 15, listen to what John says. Now, this is the confidence that we have in him. It's not in our prayer technique or our prayer pattern. The confidence is not in the way we pray. The confidence is in the one to whom we pray. This is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. So again, what you're asking for, what you're seeking after, what you're knocking for, it's possible that it may not be in the will of God. And listen, I don't think that God lets us go indefinitely without making that clear to us. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, you may recall that the Apostle Paul had what he referred to as a thorn in the flesh. He prayed three times for the Lord to remove that. And it was after the third time he prayed, the Lord said, no, I'm not going to remove it. But this is what I am going to do, Paul. I'm going to give you sufficient grace to bear it. Now, what was the uh, response of Paul? Did Paul said, well, if you're not going to answer my prayer, I don't believe in praying, and I'm not going to pray anymore. Did he say, well, if that's the way you're going to be God, then I'm not going to serve you. Oh, no, no. That's not the way he responded. Listen to what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may dwell upon me. You know what he's saying? He's saying sometimes a prayer that you pray that is not in the will of God is better off if it's not answered because what God gives you in place of that answer is better and more beneficial to you than if he had answered that prayer. And it takes a spiritual person to understand that, a spiritually mature person to understand that. And so let me ask you today, have you prayed today? Uh, do you have a problem? Do you have a need? Uh, do you need a sense of direction? Do you need help from God? That really puts the burden on us, doesn't it? Because we know that we serve a God who can answer all of our prayers. Because Jesus said, ask and it will be given to you. 
Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the encouragement to pray. Now, Lord, help us to pray. And I pray for all of those who are hearing this and watching this, that you'll just move upon them with a new motivation to pray and to seek your face. Father, we ask that you bless those who are sick, those who are suffering. We pray for those, O oh God, in our community who have need, in our county and state. We pray for those who have nobody to pray for them. We, we pray, O oh God, that Jesus will minister to them. We pray for law, and first, law enforcement, for all first responders, for those who are in the hospitals and the emergency medical technicians who are on the front lines who are working with people who are sick. Lord, we pray for our nation. We pray for peace for our nation, that you provide for our nation. We pray for the safety and well-being of our nation. God, we pray that this pandemic will be lifted and be no more. We pray for the upcoming elections, that you, O oh God, will move upon our hearts to participate and vote, as is our civil responsibility and opportunity and privilege. And Lord, I pray that you will put the right people in the office, keep the right people where they are. And Lord, we pray that you will bring peace to our land and prosperity to our land in the name of Jesus. God bless you. Thank you again for joining with me, and I pray that uh, something that I've said uh, will encourage and motivate you to pray without ceasing. God bless you until next time is my prayer.